course, when you make a declaration of your faith that God is great, it intimidates your enemy, the devil. He's got to go crawling back into that hole that he came out of to, to try and criticize you.
arms of Jesus. Now we're going to have a victory march. Because some of us, I can tell by looking at you, you need the victory. Amen. Some of you haven't smiled since you've been in church yet. But you got to smile if you're happy about living for the Lord. Ain't nobody mad in this house today but the devil. Can I have an amen? Amen. You need to smile when you got good teeth, false teeth, or no teeth. Just let the devil know you're not going to get my joy today, devil. You're not going to get my victory today, devil. The Lord has been good to me. Hallelujah. He said, leaning on the everlasting arms of Jesus, help me out.
Did you ever feel unworthy? Did you ever feel inadequate and insufficient? Oh, yes. But what does God say about you?
been delivered.
bless you as you make your way to your places this morning. And be seated just for a moment. How many you know that the Lord is that spirit? And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Hallelujah, Jesus. Liberty, liberty, freedom. I don't know about you, but I feel the freedom of the Holy Ghost on this house today. How about you? So while the freedom of the Lord is here, it's always in order to bring your request unto the Lord and to let him know just what you have need of. We have not because we ask not. And I don't want to go without today because I didn't ask the Lord. Amen. So where you are, just lift your hands across the church and tell him, zero in on what you're in need of today. And say, God, before I leave this house, I'm believing you to answer my prayers. In the precious name of Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the wonderful name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. This song says that his grace is sufficient for every trial that I face. How many of you know that that's right today? God's not looking for men and women that can make it along in life without the Lord. In fact, God will bring you to impossible situations so that you can learn how to depend upon Him. Learn how to lean on Him. You'll find this out if you try to hack out life by yourself. That you're going to fall short every time. But know that God's grace is sufficient for you. Listen to it. Some days it seems like all that I try and in spite of my efforts, all I produce is more strength. My doubts and delusions, all of my hopes soon erase. But his grace is sufficient for every trial I face. Oh, yes. He gives me grace sufficient for every trial I face. In each situation, he promised to stand.
then the answer is still the same. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And it's not just for you, but it's for you, your children, and everybody that's coming after you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Amen, amen. Feel the power of the Holy Ghost in the house of the Lord today. While you're, while you're in the giving mood, let's prepare to give to the work of the Lord, tithing and an offering. God's been good to us. How about in church? Has God been good to you? Amen. Praise the Lord. And you can't outgive the Lord no matter how hard you try. Just give unto the Lord the tenth of everything you have. Whether you are on security, gift money, jobs, salaries, give everything the first time of every dollar that you earn. Give it to the Lord. And watch God take the 90 cents and go further than the 100 cents. Amen. So that's how we support this entire operation of Life Tabernacle Church by one offering per service. And God blesses us abundantly for having done so. Amen. God richly bless you today. God, in the name of Jesus, you see the needs of the church. Reach down from heaven above and pour out a special anointing upon us, each and every one today, to you what you have loaned unto us. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Let's march from here to the work of the Lord.
we're looking down here in one verse, that is verse number four, Acts chapter three, and verse number four, and we're going to read only three words in this portion of scripture. That is the three words that sum up verse 4. Look on us. Everybody say that with me. Look on us. God bless you as you see it in the fear of the Lord. The greatest evangelists are the ones that can look at others and say, if you want to know what the Lord can do for you, then take a look at me. Amen. An evangelist is defined as someone who gives the gospel to unconverted people, who is responsible for bringing them out of the sinful life that they're living in and introducing them to the God that can rearrange their lives. One songwriter said, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise God for saving me. When I think about all that the Lord has done for me personally, there's not enough time to stand up here and talk to you or even rehearse to you how good the Lord has been just to me. One writer said that I can tell you that the books that should have been written could have been written. The world itself could not contain the volumes of the greatness of Jesus Christ. Now the word religion is used seven times in your Bible. Six out of the seven times that it's mentioned, it's not good. The Bible speaks about vain religion. People that profess religion who cannot bridle their tongues is vain religion. The Bible talked about the straightest sect of religion. It was so straight and restricted to others that nobody else could get into their religion and self-righteous one and holier than thou religion. And then there was the religion of the Pharisees that, that said we are actually actors that are playing a part, but when it comes right down to it, we don't have anything that can help anybody else. But when the Bible talks about in James 1.27 that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, that you would keep yourselves unspotted from the world and to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. As important as it is for the people of God to keep themselves unspotted from the world, it is just as important to help those that cannot help you in return. The, in Luke chapter 10, the Levite and the ultra-religious people that should have been the ones to have helped the man who was bloodied, naked in the ditch, they should have been the ones to go and minister to him. But instead, they were too busy keeping themselves unspotted from the world. The Bible tells you that according to the Levitical priesthood's standards, had they have touched a man that was bloody, a man that was unclean, they would have had to have gone through a purification process. And they did not want to undergo that process so they saved themselves the trouble of having to cleanse themselves by simply passing by on the other side of the man that needed them. They did keep themselves unspotted, but their religion was vain. 
because the purest religious man went to him, poured in oil and wine, dressed his wounds, put him on his own beast, and brought him to the inn, placing him in the hands of the right people. The Bible tells you in Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, that when a crowd of children had gathered themselves around Jesus. They were pulling at him, fighting for his attention and his time. The disciples shooing them away said, get out of here. The master does not have time for you. Don't you know that this is the son of God? Aren't you aware that the king of all kings is in your presence? And Jesus with scorching rebuke for his own disciples said, Leave them alone, for suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. The most important spiritual precept that any of us could learn in this house today is how can I bring somebody to heaven with me? I know that I'm going to make it. I know that I'm going to be saved. I know that beyond the shadow of any doubt, when the trumpet of God sounds, I'm going to be ready to leave this earth. But more importantly, who can I take to heaven with me? Who can I win while I'm en route to heaven? Who can I see to it that I have helped them along their way? If I can help somebody along my way, then my living will have not been in vain. Bible said to look on us. If there were ever three great words spoken by a man by the name of Peter. Peter and John having come up to the temple to pray. And the Bible says that they passed by a man who was lame. He cried out to them for alms. He only wanted something to help get him through the day. Just help me. I've been coming here year after year after year, and people have been giving me a few alms every day just to get me something to eat and to keep these tattered rags on my body. And I'm asking you, two preachers, disciples of Jesus, give me something. And Peter, having fastened his eyes on him, along with John, said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, if you were to ask most religious folk today, they would have to say silver and gold have we plenty. The things you need, we haven't got any. But not Peter and John, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I unto thee. He said, look on us. Peter was saying, if God can save me, then I want you to know of a certainty that God can heal your disease. There's some people that we put a lot of stock in, you know. You look up on this platform and I look out across America and I look at great religious leaders and I say, oh, if I could just have their ear for a moment and if I could just glean from them, they, they must be perfect. Their walk with God is impeccable. I can't find anything wrong with them. But the fact of the matter is we've all got problems. We've just got different kinds of problems. And when it comes down to it, if you would be honest with yourself in witnessing to somebody and praying with them and tell them, look on us. I want to tell you, I may be something in the Lord today, but you should have seen me before God found me. If you had known me before I knew him, you would understand why I love him the way I love him. So I got three words for you. Look on us. I can't quote scriptures like the pastor. I can't sing songs like the singers. And I can't move and play music like the other talented musicians. But I do have enough testimony to tell you to look at me. Just fasten your eyes on me. You should have seen the person that I was before the red blood of Jesus washed my sins away. Oh, I was a basket case, you hear me? I was a miserable wretch, you hear me? I was on the heap, the wreck pile of humanity, a heap of huddled ashes, a burned over brokenness, shattered dreams. But look at what the Lord has done for me and to me. And if God can do it to me, 
1 verses 3 through 5. You'll find that in the genealogies there's only three women that are ever mentioned in the genealogies of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. There were 14 generations from Abraham to David and another 14 generations from David to the captivities of Babylon and another 14 generations from the Babylonian captivities to Jesus Christ. Matthew 1 and 17 tells you that uh, 42 generations had transpired from Genesis 12 to the manifestation of the Son of God. And then going back from Abraham to Noah, there were 10 generations. And back from Noah to, to Adam, there were 10 generations, 62, some total generations. And the Bible only names three women and calls them out. And you'll find that these three women were named on purpose because of what I'm preaching to you this morning. The Bible says that first there was, there was a Tamar, a Tamar who disguised herself as a harlot and was found with child, twin boys of her father-in-law, Judah. The second one was a girl by the name of Rahab. Whenever the spies came to Jericho and was going to destroy that city, they said, oh, if you will put a scarlet thread outside of your house, that we will save that house when the rest of the city is in shambles. Rahab, they only know three things about her. Rahab the heart. Harlot. That's all we know about her. And then you have Ruth. She was not a Jewish, but she was a Moabite woman, a Gentile. Isn't it something that the Bible could have named any woman? There were a lot of great women in your Bible. Look at how great Sarah was. And look at how great uh, uh, that Deborah. And, and, and look at how great uh, the great women throughout the word of God were. A great woman in Shunem. All of these great women. What about Mary, the mother of Jesus? But the Bible did not see fit to record their names because what Jesus wanted recorded was some people that could say look on us. If God can save a Rahab, a harlot. If God could save a Tamar who was hated by her husband and her second husband and despised by her own But just look at us. The God who stopped the sun on high 
and sent the manna from the sky, laid flat the walls of Jericho, and put to flight old Israel's foe. Can God still answer prayers today and chase the stormy clouds away? Who turned the water into wine and healed the helpless crippled spine? Commanded tempest, peace be still. The hungry multitudes did feel. Why well, our God is just the same today. So let us labor, watch, and pray. Let me tell you, he conquered in the lion's den. Raised Lazarus back to life again. He heard Elijah's cry for rain. And healed the sufferers in their pain. Our God is just the same today. So let's keep him just that way. Oh, cast out the demons with just one word. Yet seize the fall of one wee bird. He heard the Lazarus from the grave. And I want you to know that it's just the same today. He's, he can, he did, he will. If God did it yesterday, he can. He will do it again tomorrow. If God can save Caleb yesterday, he can save you today. If God saved Joshua yesterday, but you know Joshua had a made up mind. He said, I want you people to look at me right now. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you serve the God in the land of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell? Or will you serve the God that you served on the other side of the flood? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When everybody around Joshua was about to give up, when everybody was about to, to cast in their towel, Joshua said, look on us. I'm going to go on over Jordan. I'm going to make my way into the promised land. I'm going to conquer the promises of God. And ain't nobody going to stop me. And man, I wonder if there's some people in this house that's got a look on us attitude today. Have you got a look on us attitude today? Peter and John, having fastened their eyes on that crippled man, he was just looking for something to get him through the day. He was just looking for something to, just to suffice him for the moment, a momentary satisfaction of a, of a need inside of his physical anatomy. But John said, look on us. Just about 50 days ago, I was cursing the Lord. 50 days ago, I denied that I ever knew him after I walked with him for three and a half years. 50 days ago, I warmed my hand around another man's fire and I was cursing the Lord. And I looked at him and locked eyes with Jesus on his way to Pilate's judgment hall. And if looks could kill, I wanted to die right there. But something happened just a ten, about 10 days ago when the Lord resurrected from the dead. He said, go and tell Peter that I still love him. And go and tell him that he still got the keys to the kingdom. Is there some people that feel unworthy in this house today? Is there some people that feel all used up like a has-been and you're never going to make it? Just remember, if God can take a Peter, I said, if God can take a Peter and, and use him to open up the door to the church on the day of Pentecost, then what do you think that God can do with you, brother? Don't you think that God can give you a testimony today? Look on us. Look on us. I said, look on us today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can't always help what you're going through. In John chapter 12 and verse number 1, there was a woman by the name of Mary that came to Simon the leper's house. And there were some church people there led by Judas. And Judas was over in the corner hunching the other disciples. And they were mad at what Jesus was letting this woman do to him. They, they lean over to one another and whisper. You know those kind of people in church, you know. They lean over and say, if Jesus really knew what manner of woman this was, he would not allow her to wash his feet the way that he, she is. If Jesus really knew all that we knew about her, then he would not tolerate her behavior. Now, i got some questions for y'all Jews. They're not recorded in the Bible, but just how do you know what kind of woman she is? And who made you judge, jury, and executioner of everybody that comes in here to worship 
Jesus. Who made you? Who made you the judge? Wow, the last time I read, God is the judge of all. I see people commenting and talking about church people. And they say if that pastor knew about them, what I knew. Well, number one, thank God I don't know. Because it's between them and God. And number two, maybe the Lord has already revealed unto me about them. But the Lord says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and let me give you rest. You're not so bad that you can't come into this good place. You're not so sinful that you can't come in here to this church. You're not so wretched of a man or woman that God doesn't already know about you what he knows. And he said, I love you anyway. Love you anyhow. Hallelujah. God won't drag up your past on you. You hear me? When you come to worship, Mary, I know what you used to be. Mary, I know your occupation. Mary, I know everything. I know more than the people talking about you. And Jesus said, you leave her alone, church boy. Leave her alone, Judas. Because what she has done is going to be a memorial for me. There are people in this house today that God is giving to you a testimony. And it's going to be talked about for generation after generation. But you got friends and family. And you got your own condemnation in your spirit to, to overcome. Because you're telling yourself that you're inferior. And you're telling yourself that God can't use you. But look at Peter and John. Who said to that man, look on us. If God can save me, God can save you. That's what you got to get an attitude of today. Look what the Lord has done for me. If God can take me out of adultery and homosexuality and, and alcoholism and drug addicts, dope addicts and murdering an ex-con. Don't you know that God can do anything for you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When I came in here, y'all didn't wash my feet. When I came in here, y'all didn't show me what, there was, what this woman showed me. When I came in here, y'all didn't worship me the way she worshiped me. Well, it's, 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 it's not, we've been with you, Lord. We know all about you already. See, that's your problem. You know too much about me. I need somebody with a young faith like this woman that are come in here and break an alabaster box and anoint my feet and let the aroma fill the room. That's the problem with a lot of religion in America today. We know too much about the Lord. We, we know every text. We know where the preacher's going. We know what the preacher's going to say and if we're not careful, we'll forget about the goodness of the Lord. But God, I want to remember every day that I come to church that you woke me up this morning, that you started me on my way. You put food on my table and you let me live to see the light of day. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, look over here. And, and look over here. Look on us. Hallelujah, Jesus. Look on us. That's why Paul said, I've been preaching a lot of different places. I went to Athens, Greece, and I preached the greatest sermon the Bible records in Acts 17. That's where it is, Acts 17. The greatest biblical sermon ever preached by any man other than Jesus on the Mount of Beatitudes. He talks about everything that needed to be talked about. But two-thirds of the people mocked him and procrastinated against him. So Peter said that didn't work. He goes to Thessalonica and he's a miserable failure there. He goes to Berea and it doesn't make any sense over there. So he gets to the worst possible place that anybody could go and that's Corinth. And he started preaching in 1 Corinthians 2. And he said, brethren, when I came unto you, I came not with excellency of speech. I came not with enticing words of man's wisdom. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. I thought to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. I don't want to know about your past. I don't want to know about your hang-ups and your failures. I just want to come in here preaching Jesus. And when I get up here and read your mail like I've been in your email box, and you say, who's been talking to that preacher about me? And you can talk to the Lord because the Lord has sent a preacher to preach to you. For how can they hear without 
good of a preacher. And how can he preach unless he be sent? How can they believe on whom they have not heard? For when the world by its wisdom knew not God, God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And here come Paul. He said that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the demonstration of the spirit and the power. That's why God has given to each and every one of us an individual testimony that nobody else can talk about but you. Don't you feel ashamed because you might not have been as good as somebody else. Don't you take the tuck head and feel inferior because you might not be as, as eloquent or suave as somebody else. But Brother Jeff has got a look on us testimony. Stand up, Brother Jeff. He wants to tell everybody about what the Lord has done. You should have seen the man I used to be. You, you think I've always been up here dancing and leaping for joy and backing up the preacher? You should have seen me before the Lord found me. And he goes to somebody strung out on drugs and dope and about to commit suicide because he was right there too. And he said, stop and look on us. Don't you know that I used to be just like you were? But look what the Lord has done for me. If God can do it for me, he can do it for you too. Look on us. Look on us. Paul said, if anybody should think to glory, let him think twice before I talk. Because I was a hero of Hebrews. I persecuted the church. I was zealous, like every good respecting Jew should. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the tribe of Benjamin and named after the first king that God gave to Israel, Saul. It was God that changed my name from Saul to Paul. He said, but all that I could glory in, I counted all but loss for the glory of having gained the cross of Jesus Christ, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. That's what Paul said in Philippians 3.10. Now we got a religious world today. We want to know the power of God and we want to know Him. We want to have the authority and the power to perform miracles. But not everybody wants to be fellowshipping in His sufferings. But Paul said, if you're going to know me and if you're going to know my power, then you have to have fellowship in my sufferings. That's why Life Tabernacle knows about miracles because you know how to suffer bravely. You know how to go through the fire. You know how to take it when nobody else takes it. You know how to go through it when nobody else is going through it. You know how to save the Lord. Knows what I'm going through right now. He said, I count it all at all. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me. See, we've all got a problem with that, don't we? We got a problem forgetting where we came from and forgetting our, about our problems. That's what true forgiveness does. True forgiveness says I gotta forget about it and move on. I just gotta shake the dust off my feet and move on. Because the devil, he's a, he's a sly old fox. He wants to condemn you day in and day out. He wants to constantly, incessantly remind you of who you were before the Lord saved you. And if you're not careful, the devil will get you down and out singing the blues and you'll think that there's no more hope for you. That's why you've got to come to church on Sunday morning and say, devil, take a look at me right now. You thought you was going to bury me Friday. You thought you was going to bury me Wednesday. But I'm in the church today, devil. I'm in here shouting, dancing in front of the aisles. Take a look at me, devil. Take a look at me, devil. Hallelujah. 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 They got any look on us people in here today. I said, do we have any look on us people in here today? I said, do we have any look on us people in here today? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Look on us, look on us, look on us. Oh, if you knew about some of the people sitting on that pew beside you, you'd be ashamed. You, you, you might not want to sit too close to them. But you know what they're saying? I used to be a convict. I used to be a murderer. We got ex-murderers in this house today. We got ex-dope pushers in this house today. We got ex-robbers and thieves in this house today. It's not about where you were. It's about where you are and where you're on your way to. It's not about what God brought you out of, but it's about where God is bringing you to. It's not about what I'm going through. It's where I'm going to. I might be in the valley, but I'm on my way to the mountain. I might have trouble right now, and I'm on my way to the top. Look on us. Hallelujah. Take a look at me. Hallelujah. You say, well, I want people to see Jesus.
out, but they're going to see Jesus in you. So they're going to see Jesus in you. How so? He was despised and rejected also. He was a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief also. There was nothing in him that we should desire also. He grew up as a root out of dry ground. He had no form nor comeliness. Dry, 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 dry. Some of you came up out of dry ground. It was an fertile soil. There was no, there was no weather to help the crops grow. That's where Jesus came from. 430 years without a prophet between Malachi and Matthew. 430 years without God mumbling a word to any man, woman, boy, or girl. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law is when you get to that driest spot in your life when it seems like you can't feel nothing and it feels like you ought to just give up because it's easier to quit and go the other direction that's when the Lord shows up out of dry ground and said I was wounded for your transgressions I was bruised for your iniquities the chastity your peace is up on me and I, my stripes are you healed. So don't you feel ashamed one more minute. Don't you feel condemned one more second. Don't you cry one more time. But get up on your feet and testify to somebody that look on us. Look on us. Look on us. Ten days is a long prayer meeting. You talk about dry, you try praying 10 minutes in the same place. I gotta get up and move around after about 10 seconds. I got to move, move, move. My energy wants to, I, I, I get the Lord on me so heavy right here, I gotta get up and move somewhere. Because does anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of you like to pray laying down on your knees in a, in a, in a fetal position. I pray like that. Something about me, I gotta move when I'm talking to the Lord. Uh, something inside says you got to, to, to just get around a little bit. Hey, that's what happened. Ten days they were praying in the upper room, and suddenly you talk about dry after ten days praying, but suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house. Have you ever been to the place where things weren't going right? And they'll always under the fiery persecution. But while they're in fire, they will not be consumed. It wasn't the fire that turned Moses aside. Creosote bushes spontaneously combusted all the time at 130 degrees. That's not what caught his attention. He said, I see the thing burning. But he said, it's not being consumed. People get into trouble all the time. But what's the matter with these people? They just don't seem to quit. People, people get persecuted all the time. But what's the matter with those church people on the corner of Hooper and Blackwater? Seems like they'd have already been consumed. Seems like they'd have already given up. We might be on fire, but we're not consumed. And the Lord spoke to Moses. Hey, it's not about, it's not about your trouble today. What's really important is are you still in it? Are you still in the fight? You're still in the fight. Hallelujah. Anybody can give up when the going gets tough. Just gotta keep on going. 
Moses said, I thought the Lord was through with me. I'm 80 years old. And I got two sons. I got a, a beautiful wife. 80 years old. I'm set up. And God took 80 years to prepare Moses for a 40-year ministry. Moses' life is in three periods. Zero to 40 in Pharaoh's house. 40 to 80 on the backside of the desert. And 80 to 120, he was working for God. Hey, God set a large foundation for Moses. And some of you think that you hadn't gotten to where you want to get yet, that God's finished with you. Look on us. I said, look on us, Moses said. I was 80 and I was on my way out. But all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, you're just fixing to get started. Some of you, I think that life is finished with you today. But God is just fixing to get started with you in the church, on your job, in your ministry, in your house, with your family. God saved me for a purpose. Everybody else around me my age was murdered because their parents aborted their children, but they said, not me. They saw that there was something special in me. God sees something special in you. That's why he called him Moses, drawn from you. That's why God drew you out of where he drew you out of. And he put a new spirit inside of you. That's why, that's why they called him Moses. He was drawn out of the water. He was a helpless little baby. But that's what God did for you too. He drew you out of sin. The rest of your family might still be in sin. The rest of your family is still on the wreck pile of humanity. But look what God brought you out of. Aren't you special today that the Lord can give you a look on us testimony? Look on us. Look on us. Look on us. Hallelujah. Esther said, Boy, if anybody could be bitter, it could be me. But bitterness is like drinking a poison and hoping it will kill my enemy. If anybody could be bitter with God, it could be me. Dead parents, an uncle that wouldn't protect me, kidnapped out of the confines of my home in the middle of the night, brought to a palace. Everything about me was changed. My name, my apparel, my diet. But she said, instead of sitting down, quitting. I must see why did God put me here. She said, I have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. For such a time as this is why God brought me here. They're fixing to exterminate all of my nation. I'm, I'm a Jewess and nobody knows about it. This is why God put me here. Because they're fixing to kill all the Jews. Haman's fixing to murder them. Oh, some of you had better be careful. Because when you get in a place that you don't want to be. And, and you're in an unfamiliar surrounding. And you're pr praying, God, why did you put me here? I don't want to be where I am. I don't deserve it. And you can get angry at the people that let you get into the mess that you're in. Instead, why don't you remember that God put Esther right where he wanted her. And she had a look on us attitude. When I get into unfamiliar places that I don't want to be. And I don't deserve to be there. And I don't know why I'm there. I've got to remember what Esther said. Look at me. God brought me here for this time. Everything that I've gone through is for this one moment in my life. Everything that I've ever faced was for this one moment in my life. Everything that came against me that was wrong and wicked and evil is so I could have this testimony today. Look on us. And he fastened his eyes on me. He said, what do you got to show me? He said, I'm going to reach down and pick you up. And whatever faith, that's what faith is. Faith isn't just talking to the need. It's reaching down to the need, grabbing it by the hand when you don't know if it'll work or not. Picking him up. And immediately, his ankle bone received strength. He went running and dancing and leaping. He said, hey, 
What are you, aren't you the man that's supposed to be crippled? Yes. But they had some look on us, people come my way. Hey, isn't there some people in this city on your job, in your neighborhood, that, that they've been cripples a long time? I said they've been strung out and hung out a long time, but they wasn't counting on you coming by. They wasn't counting on the testimony coming by. And you got to them and said, aren't you tired of being a beggar? Aren't you tired of, of just making it day to day? Why don't you come and look on us? Hallelujah. That's right. Yes. Sister Diane said, look at us. That's one of the best soul winners you ever meet right there. She's got a, oh, she got a good heritage, you know? Oh, she got a good background, worse than most. That's not what it takes, brother. See, that's not what it takes. It takes somebody that says, Lord, I'm available to you. You see. Look on us. Reach down and pick him up. Hallelujah. Amen. God is bringing the United States to America to its knees today. You know why? So that you can go to them and say, I've been where you've been. But somebody came and picked me up one day. Somebody brought me to the church. Look at me. Oh, I used to be just like you were. But look at me. Somebody come to this altar today and say, Lord, give me a testimony. God, can't you help me too? God, can't you pick me up, Lord? He don't know. He don't know. will be greater than your past. 